To engage students in that complexity does take quite a bit of skill on the teacher's part. There are theories about um, how hegemony works and that up until high school, you know, the schools are training people to be good quality citizens, which means that there has to be a, um, a certain amount of conformity. You need to be somewhat solid before you can look inside at some of those areas that have not worked well. At what age do kids become able to handle the truth? I'm not sure. My little girl is, in, is going into fourth grade, you know. She understands aspects and elements of the Irish famine, for example, of African American and slavery. She understands aspects of that, but she doesn't see the full picture, nor should she. I think American people can handle a lot more freedom, and students can handle a lot more intellectual freedom earlier than our society or our system seems to let them. We could say, like, the, the way Americans vote today is because of how they were educated 15 years ago. You know, I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that influence folks and in terms of how people vote. And there's millions of dollars spent on that, probably exceeding what goes into the study of history in our country. Okay, so I could argue that point and I think be successful at that. It has been said that those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it, which is not to say that America has not learned from some of its actions. Fundamentalist religious beliefs no longer lead the country. Religious social structures had given way to secular economy forward thinking, and the U.S. no longer felt the impulse to prove itself to Europe. It intended to leave the world in awe. But following the ultimate failure of many covert actions, one thing that remained ever present was a core sense of American exceptionalism. Loss of control in Iran and Vietnam had left the United States with a blemish on its record that the public nor government could deny. But there was a pang of irony that an actor turned president hoped to repaint the American image with a theatrical show of force, yet it was exactly what happened. A suicide bombing killing hundreds of servicemen in a recent hostage situation were the final straws in President Reagan's decision to invade former British colony Grenada. This marks the first but not final time the U.S. openly ignored international law and used force in a foreign country. Although the Grenadians would initially welcome the overthrow, the aftermath would ring all too familiar. Historically, the U.S. only succeeded in disrupting undesirable systems of government, but never stayed to see the establishment of a new government. Despite that, Reagan restored some faith in American capability and ideals, although the overthrown government suffered rather than flourished. But this pattern was not noticed, and Reagan would continue his effort to restore American honor by financing and arming Iraq to fight Iran. This pattern would continue in Panama and Afghanistan, while bad seeds sown earlier began to bear bitter fruit. The CIA continued its covert work globally, supporting Noriega in training insurgents in Panama, financing Pakistan and the ISI to act as intermediary to Afghanistan, and training Afghan soldiers to fight the Soviet Union. Consistent collaboration with insurgent sects and dictators would achieve short-term financial and political goals, but fail in causing lasting change. But of all American invasions, the invasion of Iraq is the most puzzling, although it seems it possesses many of the elements behind other overthrows. Iraq was politically volatile, in possession of oil and territory of political influence, and weakened by its current system of government. But the difference in this situation was the personal political entanglement. In many ways, we had created our own problem years earlier, and we're now facing it. President George W. Bush sought to redeem his father and a sense of American exceptionalism in a theatrical show of force, much like Reagan. But he only gave the term more duality by opposing international law like Reagan and by alienating the international community. The operation was a failure in almost everything it sought out to accomplish. It had not been quick, easy, glorified, nor did it produce any weapons of mass destruction. It is established that to enact any lasting change, a longer stay and possibly more resources than we have will be required. The future of this outcome, desired or not, is dubious. The persistent question in relation to this war in Iraq seems to be reduced to why. Although there are many reasons such as personal vendetta and oil, no one answer seems to justify the question. But there is another vital question we have to ask ourselves. Will this happen again? In defense of the national interest, the United States has intervened and caused direct change in governments. Among those are Grenada, Panama, 
Afghanistan and Iraq. What are the salient elements leading to each of these invasions? Professor Kensey. Well, in addition to the uh, terrorist bombing in Lebanon at that time, this is the period not too long after Vietnam. It's a show of force, a show of American strength on a small island that really wouldn't be able to uh, defend itself. My name is Ronald Reagan. Ain't you supposed to be good with a gun? Good enough? I think that uh, part of the, our popular culture that has really played into our willingness to intervene around the world uh, is that part that has to do with Western movies. We all grew up watching those Westerns. Now think back, what is the general paradigm of these Western movies? In most of these movies, you've got a lawless town or a lawless region, a place where a decent person can't live and can't raise a family because a bunch of bandits or evil thugs are dominating it. Then, one good man with a gun shows up. Nobody has hired this man or given him any authority. Uh, and in fact, people are very critical of him. They don't like him. That not only doesn't discourage him, that just adds to the moral stature of his mission. So he goes in, and by killing just a few people, he's able to turn the whole town into a safe place to live. Because the evil in that town was not coming from any force or uh, any community. It was only coming from a couple of bad people. Once he kills those bad people, everybody can live there freely, and he walks away into the sunset. I feel that this uh, stereotype has really penetrated into the minds of many Americans, and particularly many American leaders, including the, some of those who might identify with the, the Texas history that uh, is the basis of many of these uh, Westerns. We look around the world, and we see a country like Iraq. That's the town where there's a brutal oppression going on. An ordinary decent person can't live. And it's not because of historical forces or the region or resources or political forces. It's because there's just a tiny little group of thugs that are terrorizing. So we don't need the authority of Iraqis or anyone else. We're the good man with the gun. Our knowledge, our certainty of our morality is all the authorization that we need. So we go over there and we decide we're going to kill the bad guys. You never saw a Western movie that ends with John Wayne sitting across the table from the Indian and saying, look, you got to live here. I want to live here. I'm sure we can work out some kind of an arrangement where all of us can live here together. That's not the way they end. They end with a gunfight and one guy's dead on the floor. This is the way Americans think that international conflicts should also end. It is sad, you know, that we have come to the point in history where we are. We start to see um, a, a history of genocide, I think. In Guatemala in particular, there was um, uh, decades of upheaval and violence and uh, thousands killed. In many of these nations, there was massive genocide, uh, 600,000 Philippines dying and tens of thousands of Cubans dying. There is over a million people in Iraq you know, that have died because of, you know, our military invasion in that country. You don't really hear hardly anything, you know, about that. We need to think more about killing and conflict, and we did not do that enough, especially in the case of Panama. Um, Noriega was a very corrupt commander that was in control of Panama. He used violence and he used murder. And for the longest, America did not get involved because they, they Noriega at the time favored America and we benefited from him in a sense. One of the other reasons we didn't go into Panama earlier and stop Noriega was because he was on our payroll. He was a CIA operative. 